So in thinking about um, the Roman contribution to modernity, so Rome, of course, begins according to the uh, stories that the Romans put out there. Uh, from Romulus and Remus, who are apparently um, breastfed by wolves, which sounds like a very interesting story to tell. Um, but so from about 700 uh, AD. But where we pick up on the Roman Empire is not that far out. Um, the Romans had uh, some sort of government, uh, but when we begin to get down to the Roman Empire from about 500 uh, BC, this is where things get uh, a bit more interesting. Uh, and so over time there was uh, questions about uh, for example, who would make laws, uh, what were the different uh, privileges and immunities of the different um, members of the Roman society. So, for example, there were two classes of people, the plebeians and uh, the patricians, and the plebeians were the commoners, so regular people. Uh, the patricians were the wealthier so sort of upper class. And so if you begin to think about what were the privileges of each of the classes, uh, we see the plebeians, for example, had the freedom to intermarry with patricians. Sometimes they could hold elective office um, and they could make laws. But it's important to note that uh, Rome, Roman government was divided into two. So the patricians who are the senators, um, they actually held office for life. So kind of like what the U.S. began with. Um, and so the Senate, they didn't need to be elected by the people. They would be sort of appointed and they'd be over there for life. If you actually think about most Roman rulers, they were, they were uh, patricians not plebeians. Now, res publica is where we get the term republic. Um, and the Latin meaning was a public thing. So the, the deliberations that, for example, if today you want to go to a congressional hearing, or if you just want to attend Congress when it's in session, you can actually do that. Um, very interesting discussions yesterday uh, hearings on um, the contributions or not of social media. But so um, the Republic is what we think of as uh, something that was created by popular will. Um, but eventually you begin to see Rome expanding. And so the question is, how do they bring in or what is the representation of the people that they bring in? What is the citizenship? Uh, conditions. And so you actually begin to see a lot of what countries do today uh, coming from the Roman Empire. For example, uh, if you were from the Roman provinces and if you are familiar with the Bible, you might know, for example, that Jerusalem was a Roman province or at least uh, the, the region around Israel today. And so, for example, with the birth of Jesus, um, they were Roman subjects, even though they were Jewish and followed a different religion. And so you could follow your own religion. The Romans, as you probably know, did not have a religion. They just had these gods that they, they worshipped um, that were complemented by Greek gods. And so you could generally live your life without much trouble um, or both are from the Romans, as long as you paid your taxes and you... Uh, but one of the things that was very um, impressive about Rome is, for example, you could become a Roman citizen if you are from the uh, provinces, if you um, fought for the Roman Empire, I believe it was for 25 years. Now, that's a while. Um, I assume you probably know that um, the U.S. in times present and past does offer citizenship to people who join its military. 
so again, you begin to see where uh, the French did the same during the First World War. In fact, lots of uh, African Americans moved to France because they could uh, become French citizens and uh, there was less discrimination there. Uh, but so um, to be a Roman citizen, you are expected to um, obey the Roman state and serve it, including uh, in fighting, but there were also obligations of Roman citizens, and, and one of that was uh, to fight. Now, there is um, they, there are many debates about the course of Rome and how uh, success can sometimes uh, bleed into failure. Uh, and so Rome is seen as perhaps a victim of its ambitious army because it, and, and, and sometimes you would see that the people who are fighting Rome were consuls who were, so consuls would generally be the people who are ruling over some of these uh, provinces. And so occasionally you would see them invade Rome itself uh, until there was like powerful uh, military leaders. And of course, Julius Caesar was um, probably the most powerful military leader. Um, now, in Rome, there was a very, so usually the, the person who was the highest military leader or pe the person who held what was called imperium or power was voted on, uh, especially by the senators. And this is why you will hear lots of mentions of, uh, for example, Brutus um, in, you know, sort of the, the intrigue that surrounded uh, Julius Caesar, his um, assassination, the fact that uh, initially they ruled as a triumvirate, um, which is three leaders. Uh, but so senators would become consuls. Of course, sometimes it was alleged there was a lot of corruption and bribery and, and so on. But one of the things that I find fascinating about Rome is when today we think about dictatorships, we think about uh, people who rule. So for example, North Korea, we will generally say has a dictatorship, except in Rome, a dictator was appointed, which is kind of contrary to what we expect dictators to be. Uh, and so dictators were appointed for six months and they had full authority to, not that they had full authority to be tyrannical, but they were voted on. So it's not like I decide to take over government and um, But so Julius Caesar is uh, one of the most, I think, storied leaders, uh, voted consul four times, became dictator four times. And so usually you'd be asked if you can become dictator for six months, which is a little uh, unusual. Uh, and so he did quite a number of things, um, consolidating laws, uh, regulating taxation and reducing debts. Um, a lot of these empires kind of overstretched themselves. Um, he built lots of uh, public works, including, for example, a road that is still traveled on today called the Via Appia Way. Um, yeah, granted citizenship to non-Italians, especially when you could, um, you could fight for the... Um, for Rome and did other. Now, of course, we remember that he was assassinated um, by especially Brutus and um, Cassius. Now, so when we think about Rome and its contribution to Western um, sort of democracy. And, and again, I don't want us to really focus a lot on these uh, Roman intrigues. Uh, besides besides um, Julius Caesar, one of, I think, the most um, successful Roman emperors was actually Octavian, who, again, was um, part of a tri triumvirate um, and which ruled as a dictator. But so it was... Um, um, Octavian, Mark Antony, and Lepidus, but eventually he kind of um, triumphs over the other. Um, and so 
his title was the first citizen. And so sometimes you will hear, for example, the president being called the uh, first citizen. Um, the Senate gave him the title Augustus, so Gaius Octavian, and then Augustus was added by the Senate to apparently make him the revered one. Um, and so you actually begin to see elements of Western government today. Um, the veto power. The president can veto legislation um, if he doesn't like it, if he has objections to it. Uh, one of the most um, important pieces of legislation that was ever vetoed is what is called the War Powers Act. Um, a brief overview of the War Powers Act. Vietnam War is going on, 19, about 54 to about 1974, but really 1964 is when US troops um, have an influx into um, North and South Vietnam. And so 1968, there's an election and Nixon says, I have a secret plan to end the war. His secret plan was to bomb um, Laos and Cambodia which were actually not fighting because the war was in Vietnam. But if you actually look at the shape of um, Vietnam, it kind of makes sense to bomb Cambodia and Laos because that's where the Viet Cong would go through. Uh, but he kind of didn't tell the, um, the Congress that he was expanding the war. And so then the Pentagon Papers are published and everyone is wondering, why are we fighting Cambodia and Laos? Like, I thought we were fighting the other country. And so this Congress came up with uh, the War Powers Act, War Powers Act. Um, and the argument was that um, because they have the power of the purse, they're the ones who allocate money, um, the president cannot declare war without asking <clears throat> Congress. Now, the president has a, had a different argument, Nixon, that he was the commander in chief. He did not need to ask the Congress if he can declare war. That is the job of the commander in chief. And so clearly there was a disagreement. And so the War Powers Act was passed by Congress by veto proof majorities, but actually Nixon still vetoed uh, the War Powers Act and the Congress of course voted to override the veto. But there's been other, um, other legislation that has been vetoed. And so the president will refuse to sign it into law and will give the reasons why. And so you can sort of see that uh, vetoing legislation goes back all the way to uh, Octavian about 2000 and some years ago. Um, again, he, um, he did rule as a dictator Again, he was uh, invited to be a dictator. Um, yeah, and he was uh, given Senate approval to rule. Now, some will consider him to have been a good emperor. There was uh, a number of uh, emperors that were actually uh, considered to be good emperors. But of course there were the, uh, maybe the, the ones who had scandal, um, like uh, Mark Antony who yeah, was the grand nephew. Some say he was the son of Octavian. Actually, there's a whole bunch of uh, like whether he was the son of uh, Julius Caesar or he was a nephew or he was adopted or something. Um, and so his biggest scandal is with uh, Cleopatra, who was the Egyptian queen. Um, and there was uh, there are those who believe that there was an affair between Cleopatra and Mark Antony and the whole suicide murder thing that happened. Um, <clears throat> yeah, so Julius Caesar may have been um, the grand nephew or the adopted son of Julius Caesar. It's, it's not, uh, but if he was the son, adopted son, okay, maybe adopted son. Um, but the scandal was with him and uh, Cleopatra. Um, so, yeah. So we are not even going to go into the scandal. It, I tried to follow it and I was like, um, 
Octavian, who was the um, who was the uh, consul or the uh, sort of Caesar. Um, Mark Antony married his sister and then falls in love with Cleopatra, and um, they had kids. And anyway, it was um, it was a scandal that that no one really can make sense of it. Uh, but what we can make sense of is um, that even though Rome had some stability and some governmental structures, uh, in 193 Common Era, or what we often call AD, there were five emperors. And these are the five emperors. And there was, so as they, there was a lot of murder amongst themselves, like like someone would be murdered and it's like they begin in July and by the next April they've had like five um, five emperors. And, and part of what I was mentioning is, for example, if you see number three, Pisenius Niger, he was the African consul, so he, his rule extended to North Africa. And so they would all march on Rome, well, march or sail on Rome. Um, and, you know, sometimes their alliances would change based on the, because they had to convince the senators that uh, they were now in charge. Um, so 193 to 194 AD is often known as the year of the five emperors. Um, or at least they claimed, um, some of them were actually a tight uh, some of them were pronounced uh, Roman emperor, some just, yeah. Um, and then um, there is a period of Roman rule, so sort of the height of the Roman Empire, where we think of the five good emperors. Um, and so you can sort of see this reign between uh, 96 AD, Two, just before the year of five emperors. And so these are um, Narva. And again, you can see he was installed as emperor by assassins. So it's probably not the most auspicious way of uh, coming to power. Uh, so Domitian was the previous emperor who was assassinated. And then, um, but Trajan, Hadrian, uh, you might be familiar with Hadrian who built uh, Hadrian's wall. Um, I think it might be somewhere in Europe. Uh, and of course, Marcus Aurelius. So the, the most uh, expansion, including to Britain, perfecting their defenses, uh, uniform provincial systems, and the client states were constituted as uh, Roman provinces. So, um, so there was, now of course, during this period, of course, there was a Senate, there was uh, the um, uh, plebeian assembly. So it was, um, yeah, and so those are the uh, five um, uh, busts of the five good uh, emperors. But so when we sort of think about, uh, we looked at some Greek contributions to modernity, uh, and we looked at, for example, the columns that adorn uh, many of the buildings in um, many of the government buildings in D.C., the White House, uh, Congress, the Supreme Court, uh, many of those are Corinthian columns, so Greek columns. Uh, but the uh, University of Virginia in, um, in um, Charlottesville, uh, the rotunda that was built by uh, Thomas Jefferson was actually, I think, uh, yeah, a fifth or two thirds of the Pantheon. The Pantheon was um, sort of the um, uh, temple of the Roman gods. Um, and so he built it at two thirds um, of the structure. And so what he built is what is on the left and the uh, Roman Pantheon is uh, what is on the um, on the right. And so you can sort of see how we are borrowing. Now, I don't know, it might just be me, but I think uh, Greek 
architecture was much better than Roman architecture. Even though Roman architecture was very functional, so for example, we still have roads that are used, aqueducts, um, those kinds of things. But um, yeah, I, I, I think that um, the, the Romans, the Greeks had better buildings. Um, but so again, you can sort of see how sometimes even the Western governments are inspired by Rome and um, by uh, by Rome and by um, Athens uh, in the models of government and so on. Now, so the Roman Empire, um, so the Roman Empire actually splits. Um, in, I think it was 313 AD or sometime thereafter. And so it splits into the Western Roman Empire and the Eastern Roman Empire. Now the Eastern Roman Empire becomes the Byzantine Empire. Byzantine Empire. Um, you may be familiar with people like uh, Justinian, um, with uh, Constantine. So who actually created the city of Constantinople, which is today's Istanbul. Now, the Western Roman Empire, so eventually the, the Eastern Roman Empire will be taken over by the, by the um, Ottoman Empire or Ottoman Turks, and they are going to make it into the Ottoman Empire. Now, the Western Ottoman Empire will eventually become, um, very much later on, Germany. But for the longest time, it was the Holy Roman Empire or the seat of Catholicism, even though um, the... Vatican is in Rome, um, you can see Rome as the seat of the of Christendom Catholicism, but that empire extended all the way into Germany. Now, uh, we shall not really go into the specific developments of the Eastern or Western Roman empires. But it is important to, I think, mention that um, when, according to the Bible, Jesus' followers were being persecuted. Um, by about 313 AD, the church in the state, so um, for example, if you think of the council of, um, um, getting the name, um, that actually adopts Christianity as the official Roman religion or Catholicism. That was about 300 and something AD. So it, the religion moves quickly from persecution to official religion. Now, in 800 AD, uh, church and state become one. Now, one of the tenets of this country is separation of church and state. But before we talk about separation of church and state, we have to think about when did they become one? And so 800 AD was when church and state became one. Um, and the specific event was uh, the, the coronation of Charleman, not the one in New York, the one in um, France. Um, Charleman, <laughs> Charles the Great, <laughs> in, uh, the one who calls himself the God. Um, so not that one, but Charles the Great, 800 AD. So he is, uh, cr he is uh, maybe anointed by Pope Pius the ninth or the 10th. Um, and so, now church and state became sort of one. In fact, during the um, following years, there'd be a lot of uh, integration of church and state. Uh, in fact, church became state. So the Pope ruled over, you know, a whole bunch of dominions. Today, the Catholic church, I am not trash talking it, uh, is probably the richest um, property owner in the world. There's uh, many reasons for that, um, including, for example, indulgences. So the um, idea that when you uh, left this planet, you went to one of, three, or one of three places, heaven, hell, or purgatory. 
Now, if you're in purgatory, people could buy you out by indulgences, by giving property, by giving money, by... Now, I, I think that would have been a... That, if that was true, I don't know if it's true. Um, but that's one of the ways in which our priests and churches made money. Uh, but so, generally, we kind of do refer to this as the Dark Ages when knowledge was subsumed. Um, and some of the reasons for subsuming secular knowledge. So if you go back to um, the, the philosophers we've been talking about, for example, Aristotle, Socrates, and so on, they kind of argued as far back as like three, 400 BC that the earth was not the center of the universe. And then, you know, <clears throat> religion asserts that the earth of, is the center of the universe. And if you disagree, yeah, there's a very simple precept that it was better for your body to burn and feel pain and to save your soul. So if you disagree, oops. Yeah, I, I, yeah the church did some things um, and, and we shall... Uh, but so this is where uh, being burnt at the stake, I just call it being made into stake and went to no one ate. So burn your flesh or your soul to be. Yeah. Like you sinned against God for believing some things that were not true. Galileo and Copernicus almost got burnt uh, for saying that the, uh, the sun was the center of the universe heliocentrism and it's like so you're telling us that um, the bible verse where joshua lifts his hands and the sun stands still is not true now technically the bible was i mean joshua was the sun stood still the sun never moved the sun never moves right, right? but everyone thought the sun moved. So when Joshua prayed, it stood still. And so Copernicus and Galileo are saying it did not. And they were right, even though the church thought they were wrong. So, But they barbecued lots of people, including, for example, John of Arc, who apparently saw visions. And um, but yeah, So this, this Dark Ages, you couldn't talk about the church, but they, it's more than um, talking about the church or disagreeing. It's also about uh, what knowledge was out there. So even though, for example, when Jesus was born, some of those who visited him were, I would think, astronomers because they were wise men who followed the stars. Mm -hmm. So, but then it's sort of like all this knowledge. This is the knowledge that Columbus would then use to come and, you know, mess up the Americas. Uh, but so from about 400 AD to about 1453 AD, there was a lot of darkness. And this is not why we, in, in terms of knowledge. And uh, interestingly, ironically, it is the um, Muslims who open up these archives in Constantinople and publish all these manuscripts. They translate them. They Columbus would probably have been lost without that information. Um, so sometimes we have the Muslim world to thank for um, exposing this information. But so this is the, uh, the, the Dark Ages. And you can actually see some of the, some people might call it the religious age. Um, everything, including the two-dimensional pictures, uh, reflected elements of religion. So the, this is not the birth of Jesus, but some, well, maybe it's Jesus healing someone or other. Um, but yeah, you, you see, well, this is the medieval ages. This, this is not, this, this wouldn't have been good for us, I don't think. Um, but yeah, it, it just looks like chaos and, and dirty and, um, yeah. Um, 
like a marketplace. But there's, there's a lot of emphasis on religion um, during these periods. This is actually taken from uh, the Norman Conquest when uh, William and Otto and his brother crossed the Normandy into Britain to uh, end the Germanic, was it Germanic? So the, the uh, Norman conquest, when the modern British people invade the... Uh, now, of course, before that, there were Romans who, who were ruling in um, uh, Britain. And so that kind of puts an end to their reign. You might recognize this from... Um, hmm. The 300, maybe. Yeah. Um, but so the, 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 this I include because of the, um, if you think about the fighting men of the uh, Dark Ages, mercenaries uh, would use these kinds of uh, spears and swords and chainmail, um, chainmail suits that were really actually heavy, that were armed. Um, the religious drawings, again, um, this looks like chess mm -hmm. and a funny dog. Is it? Is that a dog? Is that a squirrel? <laughs> is it a squirrel or a dog? The, so this looks like a squirrel? No. No, that to the left. This one? What is that, a fox? Or a fox? <laughs> Just sitting there, or maybe it's a it's deer. Uh, but so again, these two dimensional figures. I'm not sure if it's because they are two dimensional. But why didn't they barbecue this lady? The second one from the right. She doesn't seem to be understanding the essence of uh, Christianity. Um, now. Of course, this might uh, bring us very well to Dante's uh, comedy and the best representation of uh, heaven, hell, and purgatory. Um, I think this here is hell. And there's an image of the devil somewhere. It's one of those, mm -hmm. yeah. especially it's like a beast with the horns and it's mm -hmm. got a tooth. Yeah. And then um, purgatory. It's to the right. Or is it? I thought it was. Or is that heaven? Wait. Looks like. So this comedia picture in theory has all the three. And I thought I used to know which one was which. Oh, that is Jesus receiving people, maybe, into heaven. So where is purgatory? Hmm? Yeah. Like this looks like um, they're into heaven. heaven. So purgatory might be, and purgatory was uh, estimated to be somewhere. Spirits are floating and, uh, you know. Eventually, if you pay enough, you're going to come out of hell and the devil and uh, oh yeah, there's a b bunch of devils there. Um, and so you sort of see this idea of what religion was and what you could and could not do and, um, um, and how violating the church's tenets could be. Um. Now, as we get out of the uh, dark ages, we begin to see uh, those kinds of representations. This is um, Sandro Botticelli's Banquet in the Forest. Um, it's painted. Hmm? It's painted during the uh, Italian Renaissance, during the, uh, the the Black Plague. I'm not sure why they call it black. Um, yeah, I noticed she's being eaten by. Uh, not sure what. Dogs or bear-ish, but also people are eating, and there's someone who is on a horse. He thought he bought a slice from that. Is it him? <laughs> the dogs. Mm. 
Uh, but so this is now you can see and and even maybe without necessarily looking too deeply if you contrast these pictures this is like 3d like you can see depth uh, but so during the black plague which i object to that term um, the bubonic plague people are coming out of this um, and this this a bit more questioning of um, religion and of course, nobody wants to come right out and, and say things, but we are going to begin to see the uncovering of even like the Greek statues that we mentioned had been covered during the Dark Ages because you couldn't show nudity. And, um, and so this is the front end of the Enlightenment. So about 14, I think this was painted in 1437, but so 15, 1453 was the fall of Constantinople, um, Columbus 1492. And so we are, we are beginning to see some changes, some formation of new states. We are going to see people like Machiavelli beginning to write about um, what they think good rulers should be. Uh, we are going to begin to see the posting of the 95 Thesis by um, Martin Luther, questioning particularly uh, indulgences and whether we can actually buy our way out of purgatory and, and whether we are all lay preachers and we should just be confessing our sins directly to God, um, which of course the Catholic Church still um, doesn't mostly um, so yeah, that's apparently the uh, nailing of the 95 Thesis on the right, uh, on the left. Again, you can still see this transition from um, almost no colorized uh, two dimension. So this is apparently someone who is selling indulgences. Now, indulgences became like um, those... Uh, <clears throat> now, you do not need to confess to this, but um, anyone ever bought a bootleg movie? So, so bootleg movies are really huge in Kenya right now. Um, but actually you like give them your phone and they download, download it for you, which is um, now. So what, so initially the, the indulgences were sold or were made available by the church. And then people actually just started going around selling them. Um, and they would just fake like the signatures of the Pope and the bishops and so it became a business and so you can sort of see how evil that man looks selling indulgences and these people actually it's like a whole market of indulgences um, and so when we think about the religious reformation now the indulgences were not the only thing that uh, Martin Luther objected to it's it's a whole bunch of things but if you actually think about like the 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 decadence of the church if I might say so um, has anyone watched um, there was a Netflix um, maybe show or special um, House of Borgia not heard about it you might want to look it up so the house of borgia is um, based on a pope whose name was uh, cesare borgia and so he was a pope but he had these affairs and kids and scandal <laughs> exactly and so you're thinking the pope should probably not maybe have had outside children and children. even children i mean maybe, maybe we shouldn't talk ill of the church but you know there's there's some people in the catholic church who have kids when they are priests and um but so like cesare borgia even had like the the lovers of his lovers killed and he's the pope you are like maybe don't have people killed but so this is the whole decadence the church is that martin luther is kind of pointing out that we are selling indulgences we are telling people they are going to go to heaven and by the way the pope is having kids and affairs and uh, 
Yeah, but uh, so you know, again, we 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 see that period as part of the dark ages, even though it was in dark out of holiness. Um, yeah, and so this I think brings us to what I call the three R's: um, the religious reformation, the scientific revolution, and the enlightenment. Now, the enlightenment doesn't have an R in it, but I sort of like to think of those uh, three revolutions that occur from about 1915. Now, of course, the religious reformation is very easy to sort of think about. Martin Luther, Lutheranism, Calvinism, um, the Puritans, and so on. Um, actually, it's, it's also, you are familiar with um, Catherine of Aragon. No? Henry VIII? Who was he married to? Yeah, I suspect he divorced Catherine to marry his other women that he killed. He killed like the next six or seven of his wives. Um, but he was a supporter of the Reformation. Was it because they wouldn't have a boy? Yes. Okay, yeah. yeah, so if you... Uh, he killed his wife because they didn't have both. Well, first he divorced the first one, but he actually was a supporter of the Reformation. So in Catholicism, you could not divorce. Mm -hmm. Like you were married until death. But in the Reformist religions, they were suggesting that there were reasons that you could divorce someone, including that he was the king and, you know, one, the king could do no wrong, so divorcing someone had to be God's plan. <laughs> I mean, uh, but yeah, he actually divorced, uh, I think his first wife was Catherine of Aragon, and he divorced her because she couldn't have a boy. And then he married like two other women who didn't have boys, and he wanted a son to be the heir. Right. Um, he did kill about three or four, or they would come to mishaps that you're like, that sounds very suspicious. Yeah. Um, some he just beheaded and accused of affairs or of uh, cheating on him. Yeah, so he was, um, I think he was a douchebag. <laughs> but, uh, I mean, he didn't have to kill them. He didn't. Why? Yeah, he could have just, uh, could have been like the king of uh, Swaziland. Let's go grab another one. Um, so we see this reformation, but we also see um, so even though we are not necessarily interested in those other revolutions, the Enlightenment is really, it, it speaks to the role of the church and who rules. And so later on, we are going to see that part of the argument was that people should choose to be ruled. They should appoint their rulers. Um, and then the um, scientific revolution kind of questioned the whole um, it, it sort of uh, put pressure on the belief in God as the author of all things. Like there are things we can understand by uh, by science rather than by religion. And so the first, um, I think, discussion we'll have next week is on Leviathan, which is a famous book written by Thomas Hobbes. Um, and I, I just want to mention that this is the cover of, well, initial cover of the Leviathan. And um, the Leviathan actually comes from um, the book of Job, uh, chapter 41, where he talks about there's no power above him. This was the conception of there's no power above him. So there's no power above God. So the Leviathan was was maybe threefold. One, it talked about God uh, being sort of the author of the world. Second, it talked about the, the person who rules over um, a people. And so that is the Leviathan, that, that is the supreme, that is the sovereign. But it also talks about the state, like the state is the highest authority um, 
over people. We shall talk about why Leviathan is important, but we shall also talk about um, Machiavelli. Machiavelli, not Machiavelli. Machiavelli, although I think they are related. It's amazing how people are, um, and sort of what they think or how they argue differently who should rule. Uh, Hobbes says it's God. Uh, kings are appointed by God, and therefore they are God's um, representatives on earth. So does uh, Robert Filmer and Jean Baudin. Um, Machiavelli talks about the prince and what qualities a prince should have. And so we'll be talking about um, these, um, these differences in how they see who should rule. And then we'll be talking about, uh, for example, Locke and how he makes uh, different arguments um, on that. So we shall...